it's written in the 1660s, but it's written for posterity because uh, it's not possible to publish, if you like, parliamentarian Puritan histories in the 1660s and 70s. Uh, it's only later on in the 17th century that it becomes possible to publish that point of view. Um, so it's written for posterity. When it's initially published, it comes under fairly fierce attack from Anglicans in particular. Uh, so uh, those who, who very much want to defend the Episcopal Church uh, against nonconformists see Baxter as uh, the epitome of nonconformist sedition. And they think that he's um, trying to cover up for what the Puritans did in the mid-17th century. They're really guilty for all the revolutionary events of the mid-17th century, and Baxter's trying to exonerate them. So there is this ferocious body of work attacking it. But on the other hand, people in the nonconformist Puritan Whig tradition, uh, Presbyterians, as we might uh, call them, though Baxter never accepted that term, they were anticipating a vindication of their stance and they welcomed the reliquiae. There, there were some reservations about uh, the text that Sylvester had produced because there were contenders in the field, most obviously uh, Clarendon, Edward Hyde, Earl of Clarendon, his history of the rebellion, which came out very shortly afterwards and is a very polished literary history um, and very impressive in those terms and so there was some sensitivity that Baxter's narrative looked a bit rough and ready you know it's a pity we couldn't field a man who could hold his own against Clarendon in terms of Ciceronian prose but essentially it was welcomed by this other group of readers. One of the very first uh, readers of the Requiai is John Locke uh, and Locke is also one of the first users of the Requiai because in the 1690s he's written a book on the reasonableness of Christianity, but he himself has been criticised for uh, undermining the doctrine of the Trinity, for presenting a very minimalist view of Christian doctrine. Uh, and when he defends himself in a vindication of the reasonableness, he's able to appeal to Baxter, because Baxter in the 1650s had been involved in disputes with John Owen, about the fundamentals, uh, that the English church should be organized around the fundamental doctrines. And Baxter had argued for a more minimalist view that as long as you accept the Apostles' Creed and the Bible, that should be, that should be fine. You don't need a long, elaborate confession of faith. And so in his vindication, uh, Locke reprints uh, or, or cites that passage. And in the French translation, it's reprinted at length in, in French translation. So we see an interesting example there of, of Locke, an Anglican, using Baxter and Nonconformist to argue for a broad church, a church which has a lot of latitude in terms of doctrine. Uh, and it's also interesting to see Calamy using Locke in similar ways to defend toleration for conformists uh, and, and to defend greater kind of breadth, ecclesiastical breadth. Baxter is a major figure all through the 18th and 19th century, partly because of his practical works. So his devotional works, like The Saints Everlasting Rest or Call to the Unconverted, these are bestsellers all across the 18th and 19th century. So lots of people are reading Baxter. And because they're reading his practical works, they're also interested in his life. So the life is influential, but it's, it's less popular than the practical works. And it's often, its influence is often indirect. So it's kind of mediated through Calamy uh, and his editions but also through biographies of Baxter, which summarise the, the original narrative that was there in the Reliquiae. It is read by people like John Wesley, uh, the Methodist revivalist, uh, who describes it as uh, the most impartial account of those times that has ever yet appeared. So uh, Wesley is, is struck by Baxter's account of the England's troubles in, in the mid-17th century and finds it surprisingly credible. Uh, it's also uh, beloved by many nonconformists, but there are also Anglicans who have a lot of time for Baxter. Um, so one example would be William Wilberforce, who, who throughout his life is, a, is an ardent admirer of Baxter, uh, and he reads Baxter's life as well as uh, the practical works. Uh, so for the first third of the 19th century, Coleridge is developing a systematic theology and he turns to Baxter again and again for that uh, and he actually annotates two copies um, one of them 
is in the British Library, um, and uh, you, you may just about be able to see very neat and careful handwriting. Coleridge is writing that for himself, but also expecting others to read it. So he is interested in autobiographical matters. So he, he, he comments on uh, Baxter's admirable personality, um, uh, his, his candor and sincerity and veracity. Uh, he underlines um, stories like Baxter confesses the, his sins in childhood, um, gluttony for, for apples and pears, and that, that gave Baxter flatulence in the stomach. And Coleridge underlines this and says, what admirable childlike simplicity. Uh, so he has this sort of warm sense of Baxter as a, as a likeable person. One of the aspects that Coleridge most admires is the way uh, he sees Baxter as steering a middle path between the two theological extremes. So on the one hand, Calvinism, um, the doctrine going back to Calvin that says God's decree regarding our salvation is absolute. So um, my individual will has no influence over whether I'm saved, whether I'm going to heaven or hell. Uh, and on the other hand, Arminianism, the doctrine going back to Arminius, who says that every individual can exercise their will and, and choose salvation on Coleridge uh, uh, agonizes over over this dilemma and finds Baxter incredibly helpful in steering a middle path that that's partly why he uses them, him in those theological works um, and aids to reflection was a very influential work throughout the 19th century and beyond the, apart from the steering between Calvinism and Arminianism Coleridge actually saw that method of thinking uh, as generalized in Baxter. Uh, and that was Baxter's greatest achievement of all in his eyes. Um, that Baxter wasn't content with what he called dichotomizing. Um, and the, the idea that we, we tend to think in binaries, do I have free will or don't I? Uh, the answer must be yes or no. And we go round in circles with arguments for and against. Uh, and Coleridge sees Baxter as pursuing a synthesis um, so an anticipating the question of later philosophers, especially Kant, uh, how is it that our minds are structured in such a way that we think like that? Um, and can we not go beyond that, to, uh, work out why we think like that, and then move to a third position? Um, so, so Baxter, for him, is, is about moving to that position of reconciliation uh, politically, also theologically, but also as a principle of logic. Um, and that's actually what led me to pursue these notes so was, was studying trying to study the roots of Coleridge's thought which are, are very complex and it's, of course it's not just about Baxter but Baxter becomes very emblematic. That there's quite a lot of scholarship on Baxter going on at the moment often from very different directions so you have some people who are really interested in Baxter uh, as an historian as a nonconformist others who are very interested in his theology or his thought um, and he is still cited quite a bit by uh, historians. Uh, back in the 1980s, uh, Patrick Collinson, who was one of the most influential historians of 17th century England, uh, picked up Baxter's line that the Civil War was begun in our streets and suggested that uh, the English Civil War had begun with street wars of religion, with kind of culture wars between the godly and their enemies uh, in local communities. So that's one idea of Baxter's which has actually percolated into the historiography and become quite well established.